Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's taking a look at a very special firearm. This is an FN Mag, specifically model 60-20, which is the standard infantry ground version of the gun. This is perhaps the most successful, well almost certainly the most successful Western machine gun of really all time. Uh, it is, if anything, the Western equivalent to the Soviet uh, PK and PKM, and it is a gun that has been adopted by more than a hundred countries, more than a million of them have been built. It is the gold standard of belt-fed general purpose machine guns in the West. So let's take a closer look at it today. Uh, certainly there are a lot of American service troops who are quite familiar with a bunch of different versions of this, but what we have here is an original FN production one. This isn't one of the models that's in US military service. This is FN's standard export version. And this originated what well, was developed in 1957. It was designed by a guy named Ernest Verfier, who took over the role of uh, FN's chief military arms designer in 1954. And he replaced a guy named Diodonné Saif, who had been the apprentice and replacement for John Moses Browning. So Verfier is the, the third man in a pretty prestigious list of arms designers. Uh, Verfier would also uh, be instrumental in designing the FN Cal and the FN Mini-Me. But uh, to get back to our story, the Swedes had been attempting to convert the BAR to belt feed. The Swedish military had used the BAR from the 1920s onward in 65 by 55 caliber. They really liked it, and they wanted a belt-fed version to give it a little more firepower. But they weren't able to actually make it work as a belt-fed gun. And so they approached FN to see if FN could. Of course, FN was the company that was actually producing the BAR for commercial sales, uh, international sales after World War II. FN took a look at this, gave the project to Verbier, and he came up with the FN Mag, which is fundamentally a Browning BAR action flipped upside down. Um, I'll show you the, I'll compare you the bolts between this and an, a BAR in a few moments. But uh, in 1958, the gun was formally adopted by the Swedish military, incidentally still in 6.5 millimeter, which would be a really interesting gun, uh, this in 6.5. Uh, they did convert to 762 NATO a few years later, 1962, um, for NATO standardization. Well, standardization with NATO. Sweden, at least as of the time of this recording, is not actually a NATO member, but they use the same cartridge. So um, from there, FN went on to sell these things to basically everybody and their brothers. So let's take a look at how it actually works internally, and then we'll talk about the American usage of the FN mag. There are basically no markings on this thing, so we're going to skip straight through to some controls. Although first, I will point out that FN mag stands for Mitrailleuse d'Appui General, or General Purpose Machine Gun, which is exactly what this is. Up at the front here we have an adjustable gas port, and by the way, yeah, this gun's been fired quite a lot, and uh, not cleaned as well as it should have been, but uh, we have one, two, and three gas port settings. These equate to approximately 700, 800, and 900 rounds per minute, or of course better reliability if the gun gets really, really dirty. This particular one has an optics bracket on the side, but let's take a closer look at the iron sight. It is an aperture adjustable out to 800 meters, and there is the aperture itself. It is then worth pointing out that this sight is totally non-adjustable other than range. There is no windage or elevation adjustment here. And that's not an accident, it's only the front sight that is adjustable because this is designed to have multiple barrels for sustained fire. And if you're going to have multiple barrels, it's important that they all be zeroed at the front sight so that when you change barrels, you don't lose your zero. So we have a little bracket here that locks this front sight in place. In order to adjust the elevation, you lift that bracket up and you can thread this up and down. And then the entire front sight block here can be adjusted left to right for windage using these screw settings. There's the standard flash hider that came on the mag. Uh, again, US guns have some different attachments, as do a few of the other countries that have adopted the FN mag. For firing controls, it's pretty simple. There is no semi-auto switch. 
it is full auto or nothing. There is a cross bolt safety here. Uh, this position is fire, push it through over to the right and, and you are in safe. I should also point out that later versions uh, do incorporate Picatinny rails on the top cover for sort of a more modern optics uh, mounting solution. Now to access the feed mechanism we have two buttons here on the side of the top cover, squeeze those in, you can lift this up and it is held in place by a little uh, spring, effectively a spring detent, either in the perfectly vertical position or the mostly vertical position. We then also have a feed tray here. The mag is designed to use either US M13 links, that's the M60 link, or German DM1 belts. Those are essentially the modern version of the MG34-42 belt. Uh, though the, the M13s are individual links, the DM1s are 25 or 50, actually 50 round uh, belt segments. So uh, the feed tray is different depending on which uh, which style of link or belt you're going to use. Now this is an open bolt firing gun, so when it is ready to fire the bolt is locked rearward, the charging handle locks forward and is non-reciprocating. We have a roller here that is going to operate the top cover, I'll show you that when we pull it off. And also worth pointing out that this the top cover can only be closed when the bolt is locked in the rearward position. There is a dust cover on the bottom, which is going to automatically open when the bolt closes or when the bolt opens. So that's your ejection port right there, and this just keeps gunk and crap from getting into it. Leaving the gun upside down for a moment, the bipod, which is aluminum by the way, uh, snaps into place rather easily right there for stowage and transport. And in order to remove it, you actually have to push down on this locking tab. Until you do, that tab prevents the bipod legs from coming inward. Once it's down, these can lift up. We will begin disassembly with the barrel, and this process is actually almost identical to the FND uh, barrel removal, which makes sense. This was manufactured uh, almost, at, well, they were manufacturing FNDA1s at the same time that they were making the first FN mags. So what you do is depress this button, and then I want to lock this handle in the downward position, lift it up to unlock the barrel, and then pull forward. There are a set of interrupted threads here on the barrel that are connected to the handle. So when I put the barrel in, I put it in vertically, lock this down, and then this lever allows me to detach the handle from the locking lug. So it can be in the down to the side position uh, when you're shooting, and in the vertical position for carrying the gun. You wouldn't normally take the top cover off as part of a basic field stripping, but we'll go ahead and do it here just to show you. And I'm actually going to use a punch to get that started. There we go. And then I can lift the top cover off. So here's the top cover mechanism. This is uh, basically identical to the MG42, which pretty much everybody has copied. You'll notice it is spring loaded, and this is why this roller has to be in the rearward position to close the top cover, because if it's forward, the spring is pushing this part of the cam track over to that side and it won't line up here. Uh, when this is closed, this pin would normally be holding the cam track on this side as part of the process of pulling a belt in. Feed tray can come out as well. Now the more important bits of field stripping. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the pistol grip off next. There is one cross pin back here that holds it in place. Pull that out, and the pistol grip just slides right off. And again, this is a really simple firing mechanism. Uh, pull trigger, sear drops. As long as the sear up here has dropped, nothing's holding the bolt, and it will fire until you release the trigger. 
now we can take off the buttstock, just depress this latch, and the buttstock that's just going to clear up through a set of rails right there. We do have a buffer here in the back of the buttstock, but that's that's about it. Now the recoil spring, this is kind of like one of the Browning aircraft guns, the recoil spring is captive and it's locked into the back of the receiver here. I just push it in and then up and it will come out like so. Uh, this is a multi-coil spring, uh, really good, durable, powerful style of spring. And now, at long last, I can actually pull out the operating parts. So we have our gas piston, operating rod, essentially bolt carrier, and then we have our bolt out here. And so the way this works, uh, this is the unlocked traveling uh, orientation. When this hits the breech face and stops, the two pins back here allow the bottom end to keep going. That drops this arm right here downward, and that is going to lock it in place. If we look in the receiver, our locking shoulder is right here. So if I put the bolt assembly in without the spring, as I bring this forward, the bolt is going to hit the breech face right there. So right there, it stops moving. This does. And then we're going to see this arm drop down and lock into place so that the bolt can't come backwards. The gas piston, however, will push directly back on this. So once you fire, this is going to come back. It's going to lift those two, well, that one arm up. Once it's all the way clear of the locking lugs, it then pulls the bolt back to eject the empty cartridge down, out past our ejection port covered there, and then it's ready to pick up a new cartridge from the belt. Now let me pop this connecting pin out, then I can pull really the bolt itself, the bolt and the locking arm off. You can see the firing pin here is held in place by this little uh, roll pin that's not, it's permanently in place. It can be removed, but then you need to replace it with a new roll pin. So I'm going to leave that in there. But the firing pin is actually fixed to this, which means if this is not all the way forward, the firing pin can't protrude forward and the gun can't fire. Now I told you I would compare the FN mag bolt to the FND bolt. This is more like the original BAR. This is essentially the original BAR. And you can see here that they are essentially the same gun. We've got uh, our two position pivot right here. On the FND, this is the locking surface, and what it actually does is, the magazine's on the bottom for the FND, so this, when it locks, pivots up into the locking shoulder in the top of the receiver. The FN mag simply reverses that and pivots down into a locking shoulder on the bottom of the receiver. But fundamentally, these are the same operating principle. Uh, so in, in essence, the FN mag is the ghost of John Moses Browning coming back to make what is still today the world's most popular Western general purpose machine gun. And lastly, we can take a look at the receiver here, and there's in some ways some real anachronisms going on. This is manufactured as essentially two side plates riveted into a big front trunnion here that has the, the barrel and gas system uh, interfaces a bottom plate that has the dust cover, the ejection port, uh, opening for the fire control group, and also here and here, uh, tripod mounting points. These are obviously, you know, a general purpose 30 caliber gun like this is just begging for a tripod for long range sustained precision fire. And then of course you've got your, your rear top block with the rear sight. So the, the construction method here is actually very similar to things like the Maxims and early Brownings. And this is part of why the gun is so heavy. Uh, competitors like the PK series use a lot of stamped sheet metal, uh, which is a more efficient, uh, if potentially 
more fragile or more easily damaged uh, construction. This was first introduced to the international market in 1958. It would take the United States nearly 20 years to come around to using it in any form. And the first American use of this was as a coaxial gun on tanks. The US had developed the M73 and then M85 uh, tank machine guns, which were both pretty much complete failures. They were attempts to shorten the overall length of a Browning machine gun, and they just didn't work well. So the US went looking for a replacement coaxial tank gun, and in 1977 they did some trials of the FN Mag, as well as guns like a coaxial version of the M60. The FN Mag came out on top, like by a lot. Uh, in 1975 trials, the FN Mag in testing went just under 3,000 rounds on average between having any sort of stoppage and nearly 6,500 rounds on average between actual failures, which is to say something that requires more than basically just running the charging handle to fix. It is a phenomenally reliable gun. Now it pays for that in weight. This thing weighs about 26 pounds, which is just under 12 kilos. Uh, so it's a, it's a heavy gun, especially compared to something like a Soviet PKM, but uh, it just always works. Uh, anyway, the US would adopt this in 1977 as a coaxial gun. It would then go on to adopt it in other variations for other service branches and uses all the way through until 1995 when it was uh, completely replaced the M60, uh, replaced the M60E3 as a US infantry general purpose machine gun. Now, by that point, the US military was also using the FN Mini Me. Uh, as the M249 as a 5.56 squad automatic weapon. So this wasn't, you know, if we continue to use the PK comparison, the PK is the basic single uh, support belt-fed machine gun in, a, in any sort of unit organization. In the United States military, there are two guns that can fulfill that role, the 30 caliber uh, M240 and the 223 caliber M249. At any rate, uh, this would defeat the, uh, the M60E4 uh, in trials to become the new US standard 30 caliber machine gun in 1995. The US continues to use it, continues to buy it, continues to look at new variations of it. The US is now uh, look, has, has acquired, and will probably be acquiring more, of the 240L variant, which is a, re a version that cuts uh, about five and a half pounds out of the weight through shortened barrel, lightened stock, and use of titanium in a bunch of the parts, which is a very interesting, and I can only imagine how expensive, uh, sort of improvement program. But uh, the US has thousands of 240Ls and looks to be buying quite a lot more of them. So this is really one of the most influential and fundamentally successful general purpose machine guns of the Western uh, post-World War II world. And uh, very cool to get a chance to take a look at this one. This is, of course, fully registered in the US. This is a uh, pre-1986 dealer sample. There are only something like two dozen of these on the registry that aren't post-86 samples in the US. So they are very rare guns uh, to see here in the States. Very cool uh, for Morphe's uh, to have this one and to give me a chance to film it for you guys. Thanks for watching.